In this video, we're gonna specifically talk about all the changes that were made, hopefully test some games. All right, let's get started. This section is going to contain all the significant changes made to the emulator from November 2021 up until now. So buckle up. GPU improvements and high level emulation updates or high level emulation. ARP shaders improved shader compilation times using OpenGL on Nvidia. Integrated optimizations and under the hood changes. Glitches fixed in various games plus Vulkan shader improvement. Vulkan SPIR5 shader improvement improves shader compilation plus various game fixes. Vulkan experimental options developments. Shader cache and various graphical improvements. Graphical fixes, regression fixes, minor CPU improvement. Game specific fixes, CPU, kernel, logical programming fixes. Vulkan implementation, UI changes, miscellaneous improvements. CPU recompiler improvements. Vulkan and AMD GPU improvements. Minor GPU and UI improvements. LDN3 introduction, LAN support for Switch games, it's the third iteration, Mac OS port introduction, CPU, GPU and UI optimizations, game specific improvements and Mac OS improvements, game specific graphical fixes, VRAM usage enhancements, it's a really big upgrade, memory optimizations, leak fixes on certain architectures, minor CPU, GPU improvements, overflow fixes and performance improvements, AVX512 instruction set experimentation, minor optimizations. Keep in mind that AVX512 full implementation is not applicable as of yet, but developers are looking into some workflow changes and applicable circumstances. Some game specific graphical improvements, minor performance improvements, Intel Arc driver issue diagnosis, Red Dead Redemption, huge performance breakthroughs, AMD graphical fixes and performance gains and others. All right, now that was long and dry, but it was necessary. Massive kudos and huge thank you from me and our community to all the developers and everyone who was involved in any capacity. Now let's talk about the architecture of the switch and everything's here the same. So here's an excerpt from my previous guide. To give you guys some context, these are the minimum specifications and these are the recommended specifications. Switch came in 2017 and soon after two emulators entered the scene. Yuzu came in January 2018 and then Ryujinx in February 2018. The Switch uses an NVIDIA Tegra X1 which is an SoC from Tegra family. X1 is the same SoC that was used in NVIDIA Shield. The chip features 256 GPU cores and a 64-bit CPU. It is also capable of doing 4K but then you're definitely stretching its capabilities. CPU cores are Cortex-A57 and A53 built on NVIDIA Maxwell architecture with underlying framework from AHM. Switch OLED models feature the same architecture but it's relatively more powerful. Full. Ryujinx took a well-informed approach and wrote the emulator in C-sharp. In my opinion, the hardware isn't that hard to emulate, but the shader manipulation is tricky. It translates ARM code into x86 code by doing a few enhancements. At this point, Ryujinx is pretty stable, so instead of downloading any nightly builds, we're going to download the mainstream release. After you've downloaded it, make sure to have these prerequisites installed. Okay, all done? Good. There's one more thing we need before we're off launching games. We just need to install the firmware and initialize the keys. You can download these two things online on Reddit and other websites. They get taken down constantly, but new websites always pop up in their place. But please don't do this, it is illegal. You hear me? It is not allowed, okay? Absolutely not. Actually, you know what? Shame on you for thinking that. The only way to dump your firmware and the keys is from your um. own switch. Oh, sh The only way to dump your firmware and the keys is from your own switch. Is he gone? Yes. Just pi that sh After you've got your firmware and the key files, we're gonna place it in this directory. Let's try to install the firmware now, and when we try to do it, we encounter a parsing error. It's because our keys and firmware are from different versions. To solve this, make sure that your firmware, let's say it's 12.1, the keys must also be from 12.1. After putting the correct keys, the firmware is installed, and let's launch the executable. Immediately, it's asking if you want to go with the Vulkan or OpenGL, and in the new versions, if you decide to go with Vulkan, you're gonna have your entire shader cache destroyed. Shader cache can be thought of as a rendering library. More you play the game, more the emulator can render, and it can save processing by reusing its existing iteration of rendering. For those of you who have played entire games and don't want to lose your shader cache, you have two options. Either save your existing emulator folder in a separate directory or go with OpenGL. 
Unless you've got a low-end PC and you're playing the newer titles like Red Dead Redemption, you might not even notice the performance variance between Vulkan and OpenGL. But I think there are enough optimizations made so it's worth rebuilding the shader cache. Let's go through the UI. In the UI we have the following categories and in file we have load application from file so we can load any NSP or XCI file which are switch executable files. We can also load an unpacked game so depending on how you actually dump the cartridge from your Nintendo Switch. If the NSP file or XCI file is actually extracted, you can load the directory instead of that standalone file. In Load Applet, we have Me Editor. This is the Nintendo Switch alternative to make your own avatar for the games that require them. Then we have Open Ryujinx folder, Open Logs folder, and Exit. Pretty self explanatory. In Options, we have Enter Full Screen, Start Games in Full Screen, Show Low Console. These are also pretty self explanatory. So, show the low console is actually this little window right here that tells you every single event that's happening. So it's good for debugging purposes or when you don't know the exact cause of the error. Enable GUI column so all the columns we see right here. We can enable or disable some of them depending on your preference. Show file type what kind of file types we want when we are trying to execute the switch executables. We'll go into settings in just a little bit and in manage user profiles, we can have different profiles with the different settings and names. Install firmware is also pretty self-explanatory and in help we have check for updates and the about section. In input section we have three options. First up we have enabled docked mode. Ryujix recommends to keep it enabled as disabling it will emulate handheld mode which comes with additional caveats. Direct keyboard and mouse access will act as typing and pointing devices within games respectively. Some titles may require this setting but I'm not familiar with that genre. Controller settings and in player 1 we have input device. Let's pair up our PS5 controller with this one. We can choose from different input devices. For now I'm gonna choose my controller. In controller type I'm gonna choose Joy-Con pair. You can make various button layouts for your games, save them as profiles here and load them if you want. All of these are pretty self-explanatory and you can customize your controller here in detail. But I would recommend keeping it to default. We have sensitivity sliders here and motion controls are also here. But this will only work if your controller supports motion controls. If you get like a cheap stock controller, this might not work. In some titles, you will experience screen tearing effects. This can vary from screen seeming split down the middle or several cuts in the screen. While VSync can fix these issues, it can also take a toll on your performance if you have a low end PC or a potato. Middle end PCs should be fine with this option enabled. PPTC Profiled Persistent Translation Cache is a storage for pre-translated just-in-time functions, which can load in the game, saving you some stuttering and performance hit. In simpler words, it's some stuff the emulator has done before and gonna reuse to give you a better experience. Enable Guest Internet Access. This option will give the app or the game that you're trying to emulate the ability to connect to the internet. Now, as good as this option is, it varies from game to game. It's compatible with the LAN mode, but you cannot connect to Nintendo servers. Obviously. FS integrity check. This doesn't affect performance, at least not any variance that you can meaningfully notice. Basically, this option is a checksum verification option. If your game dumps are corrupt, it can add it as an entry to the log file. And I think it displays it in our console window here as well. A good option if you run into problems. Audio backend is selected as SDL2. Simple direct media layer is, in my experience, the most compatible. Make your life simpler and select SDL2. It uses this is OpenGL and Vulkan for low level access, but OpenAL was specifically designed for 3D sound. So if you've got a surround sound, select OpenAL. Sound.io is also a C library for simple audio output. So these are your options. Go with SDL2 for most reliability and compatibility. In memory manager mode, we've got software, host, and host unchecked. The only time you will select software is for debugging purposes. Always select host unchecked because it directly maps memory. It is less secure because the address is not disguised or masked, hence it's making it less safe. But I don't think any rogue gamer going through your main memory to leak it, getting the addresses and stealing your shader cache. It carries other implications of course, but for all intents and purposes, you should be fine. Use alternative memory layout. Normally, Switch uses 4GB of memory, but by modifying memory layout, we can potentially use more than that. 
For example, 4K mods, high resolution texture packs might need more memory and more often than not, they do. So it is for debugging or for demanding titles with modifications. Test a handful of games and only enable it if you think that there is a memory bottleneck. Otherwise keep it disabled. Graphics backend multi-threading is always going to be auto. Let the emulator decide. If you've got a powerful enough GPU, this option is gonna come in handy. But Auto is gonna take care of it for you. In graphics backend, we've got OpenGL and Vulkan. Okay, so here's the thing. OpenGL has been around for decades. It's got amazing reliability, accuracy, and most importantly of all, compatibility. But in terms of speed, it's not the best unless your hardware is mid to high end. Vulkan on the other hand provides all of the above mentioned features but not to the former's extent. It is really speedy and recent as well. However, there's a massive flaw to Vulkan, compatibility. In games where you've tried different combinations of settings and it's still not booting or there are artifacts or glitches present or it's giving out runtime error, it's always a good idea to fall back to OpenGL, but in huge majority of the cases, Vulkan would do you just fine. Shader cache is always gonna be enabled unless you're doing debugging or precise performance benchmarking. As mentioned earlier, Shader cache keeps the data from shader compilation that was done previously and reuses that data to reduce stuttering in games. Enable texture recompression, as the name suggests, is a performance option for low-end PCs. By sacrificing a bit of quality, you can potentially gain some performance, but in very few titles, this can be responsible for some side artifacts. Overall, a good option for low-end PCs with low to mid-end graphics cards. Macro HLE, which is high-level emulation, only a few games suffer from artifacts when this is enabled and even those are rare and minor. It is a good performance option, so leave it checked. Anti-aliasing is to put it simply, smoothing out the edges and jagged pixels so that the render can look decent and smooth. We've got two techniques to choose from, FXAA and SSAA, fast, approximate anti-aliasing and super sample anti-aliasing. SSAA is more demanding but produces better picture than FXAA, so if you've got a high-end PC, go with SSAA, but for mid to low-end PC, FXAA should do, but if you got a potato, turn this off entirely. Bilinear interpolation is the best option and the one used in most cases. It uses weighted average of the four nearest pixel values to come up with the best estimation of the value. Most used method and in context of our emulator, you will choose Use this option in majority of the cases. Nearest looks at the nearest neighbor to come up with an estimation. FSR is Fidelity Super Resolution. Popularized by AMD, it can be useful by any GPU vendor. For new GPUs and higher end PCs, this option can be useful. Anisotropic is going to be set to auto, whatever the game requires, right? The emulator can provide. Make sure to not set it above 2x or 4x if you want to define it manually, because above these values, the difference is not going to be that noticeable, but it will add extra toll. If you want to manually specify the path for graphics shader dump, you can do it here, but it's for debugging and you'll be fine using the default setting. For online multiplayer, we can download the latest LDN build. Go to the Ryujinx Patreon, link in the description to download the latest LDN build. Don't worry, it's completely free even though it's on Patreon. And there are a couple of caveats. First up, as mentioned before, you cannot use online mode meaning Nintendo Online. Secondly, the game you want to play online with other Ryujinx players must be the same version. Before you start the online play, you should manage your user profile here. Other players will be able to see this. Main thing to note here is this setting. Disabled will disable your connectivity settings, meaning no online play. Ryujinx LDN will allow you to online play with other Ryujinx users, but the most interesting is this. You can now use Ryujinx to connect with modded Switch users and users that use different versions of Ryujinx. As amazing as this is, I will still categorize it as experimental. So even if you have a good connection, don't be alarmed if you come across some issues. You can disable peer-to-peer -peer network here. This is also an experimental option. And if you want to use a passphrase, you can generate it here. Let's test some games, shall we? <laughs>
fun. So what are you doing up at the fort? I'm looking for an old friend. Well, like I says, you ain't gonna find many folk around those parts these days. Those you do find are about as sociable as an old three to back to you. <laughs> I mean, I ain't one to judge a man by the company he keeps, but... Well, he ain't been friends for a long time. Are you planning on spending any time in Armadillo, Mr. Marston? I doubt it. I ain't planning on staying very long. Well, if you're fixing for some female company, you can do a lot worse than Armadillo. Fine as cream gravy. Okay, so we've tested the three games and given how recent these are, their performance is amazing and thanks to Vulcan and so many performance optimizations that these work flawlessly. The stuttering that we saw was because of shader building. Once you play through the game, I think it'll be smooth sailing. I'm honestly kind of impressed. It's very rare to see so much love and dedication and passion put into an emulator. Again, thank you to Ryujin's team. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this guide. Thank you so much for watching. Catch you guys later.